Hello family, I am so excited. It's so wonderful to be here, to be in the land where my aunt and godmother came from, Germany, and to be with this wonderful priest in a shrine of our Blessed Mother, the sister shrine of the Holy House of Loreto, of Our Lady of Loreto. It's, it's a very exciting thing when we're able to bring back to the United States shrines from people of Europe uh, that they can remember when they were children or that their grandparents spoke about. And so it really gives us a great deal of pleasure to be able to come to Alt, <coughs> Alt Oting. I get all choked up when I do this. To be able to come to Alt Oting in Germany, a shrine of our ladies. We're here with Father Furtner, who is the custodian of the shrine. And we're really excited to hear some of Father's insights about the shrine of our lady at Alt Oting. Father, would you uh, tell us um, about uh, you know how this came to be? Uh, is it true that the shrine actually uh, dates back to the 700s? Yeah, the shrine exactly goes back to the 700s, but uh, the pilgrimage started about uh, 500 years ago. Mm. Uh, that time it, uh, happened two miracles. It's written in this uh, in this uh, book, yes, book it here. Is, it is wonderful. And the first uh, miracle was a little child, three years old, uh, dropped down in the, in the in the river, right nearby, and the mother of this child brought the child to the altar to the shrine and laid down right on the altar, and the uh, and the child uh, got alive. Again. And you know, uh, isn't this something that we hear? A Blessed Mother at the Chapel of the Miraculous Medal in Paris, bring your children, bring your petitions to the foot of the altar. So this mother instinctively turned to her mother, our Heavenly Mother, here and brought her dead child, believing. And Our Lady interceded with her son, our Lord Jesus, and the child was miraculously brought back to life. Now, what, are, what was the other miracle that took place, Father? The second miracle was uh, a boy, I think about uh, six years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was on the wagon and dropped down from the wagon when the harvest was brought in. And uh, the wagon uh, ran, over ran, the over. Boy, ran over the boy and uh, he wasn't alive anymore. So actually, he got crushed, didn't he? he got under crushed, the wheels, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. Under the wheels, and he got alive too. And that was the two miracles. And uh, then started the pilgrimage, and uh, since about 500 years, every year a lot of people, and, and right now about a million people every year comes to the shrine, and uh, all the the pictures around the chapel shows from the from the miracles and saying thank you for helping us, uh, O oh Mother and uh, O oh Lord. When we bring you to the church, you will see all of these photographs. It's, it's a way of Europeans saying thank you for favors granted, miracles, cures. And you'll see pictures of all these people that have prayed to Our Lady for healing or a cure of some kind and were given the favor. What are we doing here? What are we doing at this shrine? You know, I think, as I look at this beautiful country we were flying in, and Germany is beautiful. And it was snow all over the place. <laughs> it's just, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Um, Captain Tro and his wife Kathleen were driving us, and they were saying again about how these little towns in Germany are so typical, and we're going to be sharing them with you today. Especially in Bavaria. This is the Bavarian section of Germany, and it is just so beautiful. It's everything that we have ever pictured Germany to be. The beauty of Germany we find here in Bavaria. We've been asked so many times by custodians, by um, priests, bishops, uh, religious, 
lay people. Why did you write the book of uh, the miracles of the Eucharist now? Uh, why is our Blessed Mother so popular once again? Why are you bringing us these shrines? I believe we are children, as Bob wrote in one of our books, I believe the many faces of Mary, we're in trouble. And we're shouting, Mama. Mm. And Mama is here at these shrines telling us that I am with you and I will intercede with the Father and the Father will have mercy on you. I think that's what we're witnessing here. The mercy of our Lord and how he cannot resist this beautiful mother, this dark mother. She is uh, dark but comely. She is dark but comely. Dark but comely like her Our sister. Our Lady of Guadalupe yeah. is dark but comely. And, Our and, Lady and her sister here in, And Our Lady here in Our Lady of Loreto is dark but comely. Our Lady of Chestakova is dark but comely. Our Lady of Altoting is dark but comely. I, I, it, it amazes me, especially in an area where there has been turbulence throughout the, the centuries, how the devotion, not, well, the devotion to Our Lady spreads and becomes greater, but that the people have the courage to continue to frequent a shrine, even in the face of danger and sometimes problems. Um, has that proven so here in Alta Oting? Uh, I know we've had uh, two world wars in this, just in this century alone, and, and this shrine has been going for 500 years. I found that in most of the other Marian shrines throughout Europe, it, it seemed that devotion to Our Lady became even stronger during these turbulent times. Yeah, that's the right, that's the right uh, one. Mm -hmm. Father, what happened if, if uh, we may ask you, during World War II, this was something I think you would remember. You were probably a child, like I was. Well, I remember a little bit, uh, yeah. but uh, as I know about here, uh, nothing exactly happened uh, besides the last days. He was an administrator, uh, Renat Vogel, we call him Vogel, was his name. Yes. And he was, uh, it was the last days before the World War the Second World War ended. Then he was killed by the German. Uh -huh. He was killed because he was. Uh, uh, he tried to get over there to the Americans and uh, to hold free the, the, the chapel and hold free the, the town. Uh -huh. mm. But uh, then was the SS and they killed the, the, the picture is right out here. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I, I know. Happened but really. nothing uh, happened to the shrine itself. No, no, not nothing happened to uh, the shrine did, itself. Did people no. continue to come to the shrine yeah, during the war? During the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like to, if I may, with, with respect, to correct Father. The Germans did not kill Father, the, the priest here, but the Nazis did. And that's really a distinction that I think is extremely important. Uh, because Germans who believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, who were not deluded by a man who set himself up as God, continued to believe in the Lord and their Blessed Mother. And as Father said, they continued to come here. Yeah. They never yeah. gave up hope. And I remember my own aunt telling me that her brothers were put in a concentration camp. That's things we don't know about right here in Germany because they were Catholic and refused to deny Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the experiences that Bob and I had in Lourdes was when all the armed services come there once a year. That is something to see. So I think some of you, we have to go and film that. But we were down in the lower basilica and they were all Germans. And they were singing and they were doing like a maypole around, around the altar. The altar. Mm -hmm. They had uh, the National Army Band of Germany was playing. And all of a sudden, everybody was saying, Heil Jesus, Heil Mary. And when they first said it, it shook us because we were used to hearing Heil Hitler. But when we heard them say Heil Jesus and Heil Mary, we knew that there was a great distinction between 
the people that loved Jesus and Mary and the people that were the Nazis. Now, I've got to tell you something very funny about this area. We have a friend who was born here and lived here during the war, and she said it got to the point where they didn't even bother coming here anymore because we were Catholics and we were dummies and we just couldn't be trained. And so the Germans, the, the Nazis really, for the most part, <laughs> left them alone in the Bavarian area. Is that correct, Father? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that God has a message at this shrine. I think Our Lady has a message. When Our Lady came to Mexico City, to Tepeyac Hill, she came to bring reconciliation and to form family. We have so many misconceptions of people, of a people, because we don't know them. And the more that we travel, you and we, to these shrines and meet the faithful of these shrines, we get to know them better. The barriers are torn down and there are no more prejudices, praise God. We have to be very, very careful that we do not judge the German people. We do not judge them for Holocaust because we have to look at the Holocaust that we're allowing in our own country. Mothers killing their own unborn children. Father, I'd like to ask you, have, in your time here, have you seen any uh, reactions of pilgrims that come here? Is there anything that has stirred you that the, the mm -hmm. amount of pilgrims that come or the devotion, the reverence the, of the pilgrims. Is there anything that you can share with us that we can bring back to the people about your experiences here at Altotin? I stay here now for a year. And my experience in the last year is even the young people coming by food to Altotin are very impressed only to go in the chapel, sit down a little bit, pray a little bit and stay here for a while. There is no uh, special mission just to come to the mother of all the things, call it. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, uh, most of the pilgrimage coming by food. The, the food, uh, pilgrimage by food is growing up the last years very high. Praise God. Sure. Now how far do they come by foot from the different parts of Germany, how far would you say? Would they walk? How if many kilometers? Most, the most uh, pilgrimage by food is from Regensburg. Regensburg is about 170 kilometers. That's a um, trip. Three, four, five days. And uh, that's about uh, 8,500 people. 8,000? Around on the, every year on the Saturday before Pentecost. Oh, Saturday. Praise mm. God. The Saturday before mm. Pentecost. Mm. 8,500 people. And you, coming by food. and you know what's exciting? Mm. The youth, mm. those who are going to carry on, those who we are passing the torch on to, they have taken the torch. And they are continuing that coming, as you say, to the mother, Our Lady of Alt Oti. It's, we've shared with you during this series that in most of the shrines that we've visited, there has been a great um, amount of young people that have yes. come to Our Lady. It's amazing. Uh, you take a shrine like this, Alt Oting, you take a shrine like La Salette, way up on the mountains in the French Alps, there's so many young people going there to be with Our Lady, to listen to Our Lady as she speaks to us. And she does speak to us there. And they walk away, they're fed. They've been fed by their mother. You know, Father, what we see on most television in the world, with the exception of our Catholic network, is bad news. How are our young people especially depicted? How are we depicted? We're depicted as uh, self-centered, egotistical, self-seeking human beings. Mm -hmm. No one pictures, no one sees the picture of the faithful. No one sees our church alive. And that's what we're experiencing at the shrines. That's what we see here, isn't it? There is hope. There are young people who are alive with the Holy Spirit. 
There are young people who believe that Mary is the mother of God and that she is interceding and that Jesus is responding. Oh, how happy. We saw a woman and she was sharing about she'd had two abortions and she was able to really keep control over her emotions until she said, when a woman aborts her child, the hearts of Jesus and Mary are broken. And I think that's, that's, I know that's when she broke up and that's when I started to cry. But here, the hearts of Jesus and Mary are filled with joy. And if they have tears, they're tears of joy. Our Lord Jesus and our Mother Mary must be so proud of all the pilgrims who have come here down through the centuries. The overwhelming amount of pilgrims who came here became so great that they had to build another church. They had originally expanded the little building into a larger church, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of pilgrims that would come here every year, and so they had to expand the entire facility. They built a new church to accommodate the ever-growing number of pilgrims coming here to the shrine. But keep in mind all the wars that took place in this land during these centuries. The people have always gone to Our Lady for help, and she has never failed them. She has always been there to help these people when they needed her the most. From the very beginning, the rulers of Bavaria since 1180 have not only given her outward signs of tribute at the shrine through the many gifts of the church itself, but it also became their own personal place of pilgrimage. They dedicated themselves and the country to the Queen of Grace of Altolte. She became their own personal mother. Nothing was too good for Our Lady of Altolte. Nobility and royalty heaped gifts on the little chapel. They brought the greatest artisans of Europe to Altoting to create beautiful statues and reliquaries for the altar. They wanted her to have a majestic setting as it should be. In 1849, Johannes Birdendorfer, later known as Saint Brother Conrad, came to the Capuchins here in Altoting. He became the gatekeeper, the custodian of the shrine. He would tell stories to everyone who came about Our Lady of Alt Alting and, and the beautiful gifts she's given us, the miracles that have taken place through the intercession of Our Lady of Alt Alting. The Silver Prince is a gift given in thanksgiving to Our Lady for the recovery of Prince Max Joseph from a serious illness in 1737. Everybody gave complete trust over to Our Lady. They knew that she would not fail them. They turned everything over to her and thanked her for all the gifts she had given them. National pilgrimages organized by the royalty of Bavaria and all over Germany would come to Our Lady of Altoting, would ask in petition and thank her in advance, and in thanksgiving they would come and bring greater pilgrimages. Everybody trusted her completely that Our Lady would take care of them, and she has never let them down, as she has never let any of her children down. The royal families loved Our Lady of Altoting so much that they wanted to have their hearts placed in reliquaries upon their deaths and placed here at the shrine so they could be close to Our Lady. Now, this was begun by Maximilian I in 1651. From that time on, Great lovers of Our Lady have asked if their hearts and bodily remains could be kept at the shrine. One in particular, Count Tilly, Field Marshal in the Thirty Years' War, his heart rests in the chapel. His body is buried in the Tilly tomb next to the church. All manners of thanksgiving have been offered to Our Lady for her intercession. All these hearts you see are in thanksgiving for favors granted, for cures, for miracles that have been given. It is no wonder that millions of people come here each year in pilgrimage all year long in procession. At times, the amount of pilgrims became so great that they had to take the image of Our Lady out of the chapel because there was just not enough room 
for everybody inside the church. They processed through the streets with the Blessed Sacrament, with Our Lady at the head, leading them to her son. There are tremendous amounts of processions here. Our Pope John Paul II came in November 1980 to be with the people and to come as a pilgrim to the shrine of Our Lady of Altolting, her loyal son and Pope, who loves her so very much, came as a pilgrim with Cardinal Ratzinger to pray and ask for the intercession of Our Lady here at Mount Olting. You know, as you walk in the door of this shrine of Our Lady of Alt Olting, the first thing that happens is that you become completely breathless. Mm. You are just awestruck by the beauty of the shrine. Mother Angelica, the words, awesome. There is a presence here. Our Lord is so present. His mother is so present. Majesty, King of kings, Lord of all, you are so present here, and your people extol you here. And they have, they have down through the centuries, from the seven, year 700 Anno Domini, they have been extolling you here, proclaiming I, you majesty, king of kings. Our, our priest told us today about a group of young people that began pilgrimaging here and the first pilgrimage, there were 500 young people, and they thought this was terrific. Today, there are 7,500 young people that come here every year on pilgrimage from the Diocese of Passau. It's on and, foot. On foot. On foot. And why not? Why not come to mother? Come to mama. Mama is here to listen. Mama is here to help. Mama is here to make things right. We hear in the Holy Mass, he died for all. And we know that Mother Mary shared, as her son was dying in the, on the cross, part of her died, waiting to be reunited with her son. And she too, with her yes, died for all. In this church, you see the greats, kings, emperors, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, barons, dukes, and the faithful. The faithful have kept this shrine alive now. During two world wars, during countless individual wars, the, Fr the Prussian Wars, the Thirty Years' Wars, wars all over the place, this shrine has remained strong. People have continued to come, even though they felt that their lives may have been in jeopardy. Over a million people a year come to this shrine of Our Lady in Alt Oting, Germany. And you know, when Monsignor Vogel and six other brave people gave their lives for peace and good, the words of the Capuchins who have been custodians here for, the, for many centuries, rather than give in to hell and hatred, they rather die for peace and good. And that is the feeling you have here. As we were watching tonight, the snow gently cascading down, and children with their mother and father playing in the snow, making a snowman, throwing snowballs, we thought, oh, how peaceful, how gently you are covering this land, Lord. We have to ask the question, why? Why? This shrine has been here since the 8th century, 700s. Pilgrimages have started to come to this place from the 15th century. Why now? Why has our Lord Jesus and Our Lady called us here, 1993? in January to videotape this shrine where people come to ask Mother for help. Here, 
you know that in our book, Saints and Other Powerful Men in the Church, we wrote about Saint Maximilian Kolbe, a priest who gave his life for his church, not only for a fellow man with a family, but he gave his life as a priest for his church. And here, he is such a hero of these people. They remember him well because many here gave their lives rather than deny the faith. You have here the hearts of men who were called defenders of the faith. So many things remind us of that period of time when the world was to be shattered. It was going to be the war once again to end all wars, World War II. And as we see so much Holocaust going on throughout the world and in our own beloved country, is there a message here? What is the Holy Spirit saying? I, I think there's a very big message, and I think we know the message. Consider the time, consider the place, consider the lady and the message of Our Lady. You know what Our Lady is saying to you. You just have to act on it. We all have to act on it. We thank you for being with us at this shrine at this time. We thank our Lord Jesus and our Mother Mary for bringing us here. And we pray that we have given you a little glimpse into the heaven of our mother. It's been such a privilege. We have been treated so warmly here. And we hope that you as pilgrims with us have felt their love and their warmth. The people of Germany, Catholics like ourselves, send you their love and invite you once again to join them physically and spiritually. We love you. God bless you. They live in hope and charity, with trust in things they cannot see. They serve the Lord through the works they do. They witness with converted hearts, with joy and peace and love for all. They serve the Lord through the works they do. And they say, we have seen and we believe we will share our faith with everyone. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.